Hello everybody and welcome back to another video in the Tower of Power Conquered Boat series. And today what I'm working on is I'm working on the Mer Control, the uh, control unit for the Tower of Power. This is the actual unit that came with the Tower of Power when I acquired it. It was in the, uh, the old town boat and... Um, I took it apart and found some pretty disturbing things for those of you who haven't been watching the series right along. Uh, basically what I found was that the wiring inside here, and, and I want to, I can't stress enough, this actually was working at one point this way by some miracle. And when I opened it up, what I found inside was that... Um, most of the wiring in here, the insulation on the wiring has dried up and cracked and fallen off. And all of the wiring that was exposed was pretty badly corroded. The wires where they come out of the switch on the back here, uh, which I'm going to get to in a minute, they were um, pretty much all devoid of insulation in very close proximity to each other. And it was a miracle that they weren't shorting out. The uh, choke switch. So let me back up for a second. This is an early Merc control that they used for quite a few years. Okay. So uh, identifying these controls, this is what's called a single lever control, even though there's two levers, but I'll get to that in a second. What's meant by a single lever control is that this large lever right here actually does two jobs. It does the job of shifting the boat from neutral to forward or reverse. But also, when you push it forward and it shifts, as you continue to push forward, it actually is the throttle. And then, same thing in reverse. If you push it back further, it actually will increase the throttle and, and increase the reverse speed. So, it's actually a really cool design. Uh, the way that this works, the way it has this this strange looking lever assembly right here that um, engages this interesting wheel and because of the design creates a situation that allows this thing to actually do the two jobs at once. So if we uh, put this in and we key that to that other lever on the back side there, okay can actually see that there is a, uh, a loop right here and of course there's another piece here that goes in but essentially you can see that the lever engages right here and what happens is as I turn this the lever back there moves and this front lever with this uh, this front wheel with the slot also moves. So there's an indentation right here and there's a piece missing that I had to order because uh, unfortunately I misplaced it during this assembly. It fell out and I didn't realize it. But it's a little detent uh, like ball or cylinder. And what that does is that allows it to click into position right there. So that's neutral. So as I rotate this forward You'll notice that that lever in the back there is moving, but at some point, as I continue to rotate, that lever now has reached its limit of forward motion, but I can still continue to move this, and that's gonna, the part that rides in here is going to actually continue to pull that cable, and that, so that's the throttle action once it's in gear. So that's, in, that's shifted in, and then we have throttle action. But the idea is that whether I go in reverse, which makes that back plate go this way, or forward, which makes the back plate go that way, that on the top here, the, th the cable is going to be pulled in the same direction because it's the throttle cable. So, anyways, I, I thought it was kind of neat, but I don't want to get too hung up on that. Alright, so this is a called the single lever control because you have one lever that does both of those jobs as opposed to a dual lever control would actually have 
two large levers like this. One to activate the throttle and one to shift. All right, so this basically locks you out from being able to accidentally, or why you would want to do it on purpose, I don't know, shift into forward or reverse gear with the RPMs up. By design, you can't do it. That being said, if you want to start the boat and warm up the engine at higher RPM, um, but you don't want to have to shift into gear to do that, well, they came up with a solution to that too. It's called a warm-up lever. And that's this lever right here on the back of the control. So this is the, this is the actual side that faces the gun wall or whatever you want to call it of the boat. I'm not a marine guy, so, you know, taking a guess at the name there. But this is, this lever is on the back side. Okay, so here's the here's the uh, the part that the throttle cable hooks up to, and there's that wheel that rides in that groove we were just looking at, okay? So, but in addition to that, we have this lever that we can pull up on. And when we pull up on this lever, see what it does is it's changing the position of the pivot point for this which has the effect of making this ball ride in that track, even though the wheel's not moving, and move. Thereby, this is where the cable comes in, thereby pulling on that cable and advancing the throttle. So this is a way to actually raise the RPMs or open up the throttle a little bit while it's in neutral. And that's for warming the engine up and starting. Pretty cool, huh? So I guess on later versions of this, they omitted this warm-up lever and they went about it some other way. Probably, there was probably something on the engine that just helped it start. Um, you know, like an automatic choke or something, I don't know. Not going to worry about that. Uh, other ways to help identify this, uh, because the a lot of these controls look very similar, is there's a part number 45880. This is a casting number. This is actually the part number for this half of the case. But if you look up this part number, that will kind of like backwards lead you to a whole bunch of Merc controls that use this, uh, this, this, this case. And they're all pretty much from the same series with very slight differences of the internal parts. The other key indicator of what series this is, is the fact that up on the top here, there's a choke button. Here's the remnants of my choke button. Look at the wires. This is what the wires looked like on the ignition switch, basically. Barely any insulation left. All bare wire. Corroded copper. This is the choke switch, the choke, sw choke button. The choke button sits here. The idea is you hold this down. It's a momentary contact switch. And that engages the choke solenoids. And then you hold, so you hold this down, the solenoids close, and then you crank the engine to start. Okay, so it's a two-hand starting procedure. Unless you're really, well, I guess you'd, well, you, I guess if you get some mad skills, you could probably do this one-handed. But really, it's two-hand starting procedure. Okay. Later on, they went to a key switch okay which sits here so this key switch right here it has basically only two jobs it has an on position for the ignition and then a crank position for the starter which is the spring loaded you know turn to start right on later models they came out with a switch that has a third contact built into it that is engaged when you push the key in the key can be pushed in I don't mean I don't mean push the key in as in like put the key in. I mean actually push on the key once it's in and it will actually close another contact and that's the choke. So you push the key in and that will close the solenoid and then you crank the engine, start up, right? So that's important to note because I'm gonna tell you about a couple of errors I made. Okay, so I knew my choke switch was bad I did a quick check on my ignition switch initially and figured since the switch was working, 
that I wouldn't replace the switch because I looked up the part number for the switch, which by the way, part number for the switch is a 54211. It's a Mercury 54211. This switch is now considered obsolete by Mercury. However, it is still widely available online. Um, unfortunately, if you want to buy it on Amazon, it's like $70. If you want to buy it at other vendors online, it's typically running around $60 or so. If you cross it to a replacement switch that's available at Napa, according to Napa's catalogs, it's uh, like $78 or, or like $90. I forgot. I, I looked at so many prices online yesterday. I, I got confused of who had what, but I just know this is an expensive ignition switch and it doesn't have to be that way so and I'll get to that momentarily so here's my tale of woe I knew this choke button was bad this choke button couldn't be more simple in design it's just a rubber piece on the top here that had a metal disc in it that when you push down the metal disc would contact these two little metal nipples right here and make contact very basic design okay so, this switch is also still available online, but the cheapest price I was able to find for this little puppy is like $20, which for what it is, seemed outrageous to me. So, me, being the smart guy that I am, or, excuse me, thinking I was such a clever boy, I ended up going online and looking at momentary contact switches. So I go online and I look at momentary contact switches, and I find that our friends over in China are making some damn cheap momentary contact switches that might fit the bill, or so I thought. So, this thing was so cheap, it was like a couple of bucks. And I think it actually had decent reviews. Matter of fact, this switch was so cheap that since I was paying the shipping on them, I actually ended up buying two. I figured, what the hell, I'll have a spare for some other project maybe down the road. So this is a momentary contact switch, which oddly enough, in the listing, had a high current rating. I forgot what the ratings are for the contacts, according to the listing on Fleabay. That being said, the funny thing about this switch, now that it's come in, well, first thing I noticed about it is that it is completely devoid of any markings to indicate what the max current is unless we go by there's an a there and a six here so this might be a six amp switch all right so here's the original listing so get a load of this these guys are uh these guys are claiming that uh this is a two pack oh that's what it was okay so that's why i bought two of them this was a two pack of these switches they're calling them 50a so they're saying these are 50 amp 12 volt waterproof car boat switch uh, horn engine push buttons start starter so like if you have a push to start application or something like that so i was like oh okay all right great that, that should do it oh they're almost gone 323 sold heavy duty blah 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 and it gives the uh length uh as 6.1 okay so the the length 6.1 cm so they're saying that these are these are 6.1 centimeters long. So that's the overall length. I should have realized looking at the pictures and seeing that that I was going to have a problem. So clever boy that I am, I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to beat the system. I'm not going to buy that expensive choke switch. I am going to buy this cheapo Chinese one, and I am going to beat the system and put this puppy right in here like this, and we're going to be off to the races, right? Well, here's the here's the rub. And it gets worse. <laughs> I forgot about how shallow this damn thing is. Let's see where this sits. See where this lives normally, way up here. Okay, and then the, you get a little bit of room for the wiring here. That's about it. All right. Um, well, this might live down here, All right, like this. Well, regardless, this I would first have to make up a spacer because the diameter of this is different than this to make this work okay second of all to get this to fit down inside there this barrel right here is too big this part's too big I'd actually have to grind out or modify this all right 
which I'm not too crazy about. And then it doesn't matter because when this is in there, the problem is this sticks down too far into here where the ignition switch lives. So by design, these things are in such close proximity to each other. This has to be here. All right. Well, I say it has to be here unless I, you know, mounted it elsewhere. Could mount this in the dash of the boat, really. Um, but this has to be, this is supposed to be here. So this doesn't work. So this is a non-starter. Pardon the pun. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll keep these. These will go in the pile and uh, I'll end up using them maybe down the road. I was thinking maybe I could use it on the, uh, I'll have to see what the amp draw is on the uh, preheater, the electric preheater on the Oliver tractor, right? That big old diesel's got that. It's got one of them big old fashion, although that switch on there works currently. <clears throat> and quite frankly, that switch is probably like, you know, 50 years old and never failed and probably never will. Um, it's the kind of switch that <clears throat> in the old days, I think they actually had them mounted in the floorboards of cars and trucks so that you actually stepped on them. But I remember like on the Earthmaster tractor and other tractors, it was the push the start button on the tractor and you had to be a man's man to push that thing with your thumb. So anyways, <clears throat> very, very uh, strong spring tension in there. Well, so I put 50 amp on here. Oh, I guess I should put 12 volt. Although it's pretty, it's pretty obvious that that's what the application is, is automotive. Uh, so I had to mark these because these Chinese guys who sold them to me, they, they might be proud of the fact that they think it's 50 amp, but they weren't proud enough to put it anywhere on the switch of the box, which makes me doubt the rating altogether. Anyways, back to this. All right, so now I got the problem of, okay, I got this issue here, right? So I break down and I order, and it still hasn't come in yet because with this whole COVID thing going on, things are a little bit slower shipping. I order a genuine mercury replacement choke switch for 20 bucks. I figure, all right, I'll just break down and buy that, right? I do that, and then I start taking the wires off and trying to clean up these contacts on here. And I either had previously broken and forgot, or it just like fell off. But I mean, I realized quickly when I started working on this, that this terminal right here had broke, is broken off, is or had or whatever. But see it? Nothing to attach to. And here's my problem. A couple of these terminals on here actually aren't necessary. Um, on some models, two of these terminals are shorted to each other when the switch is off. It's like a kill switch. It shorts out um, one of the wires going back to the ignition on some boats to ground. Probably magneto boats. But I have the Thunderbolt ignition system, the fully electronic ignition module, which does not require that. On my boat, basically, if the 12 volts isn't sent to a certain pin on that box, there's no way it's going to make a spark. So they don't have to worry about shorting that to ground when the motor's not, when the motor's, when the ignition is off. But unfortunately, this is not one of those unused terminals. This is a very used terminal. In fact, this is where the 12 volt, the always 12 volt. This is where the 12 volts in the system that is always present unless the battery is disconnected or dead comes in. So basically, when you turn this switch to the run position, 12 volts is sent from here to one of these other contacts. And then when you turn it to the crank position, the spring loaded position to crank the engine, the 12 volts stays going to that other contact for ignition, but it also goes to the contact to activate the solenoid to crank the starting uh, motor and start the engine. So you're with me so far? Okay. By the way, 
there are letters on the back here that de denote exactly which pin is which and you can go online and find any number of places to find a wiring diagram for old mercury engines that will show you that so I found this diagram online printed it out uh, this is actually there are even better ones online there are color ones available but I, I just wanted something I could print for down and dirty and quick see it says key switch off D to E that means there's continuity between pin D and pin, pin E run A to F and then start a, F, and B, which means that there's continuity between A and F, just like in run, but also B. So what happens is 12 volts comes out of F and B when you try to start the engine. And 12 volts comes out of just F while you're motoring around. You're driving the boat, right? The engine's running. And then when you put the switch to off, the 12 volts at F disappears and D and E get shorted to each other. But we don't care about D and E. They were just basically used on here um, because the wires still exist. Because again, remember this Merc control was designed to be used with other model engines. So they didn't make this just, they didn't like not make those wires exist in this thing. It was all there, but I could omit it if I wanted to. And I'm gonna get to why I might end up doing that in a moment. Well, hell, let's get to it right now. So here's the rub. This is a very critical terminal. I have no way to attach to this other than if I just solder wires to it. The way that these wires attach to this, it's a two-part connection. The wire goes through the hole and is bent over and then soldered. That gives this a good electrical and mechanical connection. If I clean this up really well I might be able to put enough solder here to actually solder a wire directly to this then the problem is the only thing keeping that wire attached to that point is the strength of the solder connection and if this thing wasn't gonna be in a boat bouncing around hitting waves and stuff and you know being under certain stresses I might be willing to, to risk that, but because of the fact that this is going to be in a kind of like a kind of a durable service situation, I don't want to do that. So now I'm in the position where it's like, oh, okay, I got to break down. I got to buy the switch. Are you kidding me? So I go online and of course, eBay is the cheapest place to find a switch. And there's a guy on there and he's got the new old stock switches or whatever the heck. I don't know where he's sourcing them from, but he's got supposedly these switches and he wants $48 shipped I think is like the best price I could find online for this switch that's a bummer so now I'm like great now I gotta pay 50 and 20 now I gotta put 70 more dollars into this thing and I already had to buy a few other little parts right and this is getting really expensive to fix this Merc control so, the reason why I'm annoyed with myself is because it turns out that the switch that they came out with, that apparently will fit in here, it's got a little bit larger body size to the back here, but I guess it will just like fit in here. It's really a tight squeeze. But there's a switch that will fit in here that essentially replaces this and it has that push to choke feature on the key so it also replaces this button so what you end up with is you end up taking this out and this out and replacing it with one part and guess what not only is that one part cheaper than the two parts put together it's actually cheaper than what they want for this damn switch up by itself so I don't know if it's just because it's no longer a discontinued. I think maybe that's not a discontinued part. Maybe that's why it's not as cheap and that the guys that are selling these. I mean, you know, when, when parts get discontinued and they're obsolete, you'd think at some point the prices should drop. And sometimes dealers will do that. I did find a dealer online who, who according to their website, the last price they had for this switch was, was $19 and change. Unfortunately, guess what? They're out of stock, meaning 
the last time they had these switches, they sold them for 20 bucks, and they don't have any more. So you're like, all right, Steve, what are you going to do? Well, all right, so I was going to break down and buy this switch, not the push to start one. Why am I not buying the push to start one? Because I already paid 20 bucks and ordered the damn choke button. So if I put the push to start one in there, then I'm going to have basically, you know, a switch that I'm not positive is going to fit in there okay without trouble, especially if the choke button's staying in there, you know. Um, the other reason is because I discovered all this yesterday, which was Saturday, and I discovered it at about 11.55 was when I decided, you know what I should do? I should call the dealer I know who is 20 minutes from here, who in the past I've won the lottery with on obsolete parts. They've got a large parts department, and in the past what he's been able to do for me is if I give him an obsolete Mercury part number, and it's a part they still have in inventory, he loves nothing more than to get rid of that dead inventory. So what he does is he sells me those parts at the last price, or sometimes even less, that Mercury was showing for the part. So if he has one of these switches in stock, I can probably get it for less than what it would cost for the cheapest one on eBay. And then I'm off to the races. Problem is, they close at noon on Saturdays. I forgot about that. And guess what time it was? Oh, 11.55 or 11.58 or whatever. So by the time I get on the phone, no chance of getting this. No chance of getting anybody to pick up the phone in the parts department. So I have to wait. I'm kind of in a holding pattern on parts until Monday. I've got to... Um, call and make sure because I'm going to really hate myself even more if I order this on eBay today and then end up, you know, paying 50 bucks for it or whatever and then find out come Monday that oh, he had one of these and was going to sell it to me for 25 or something silly like that, which would put me back in business quicker and cheaper. So, I did call by the way on the choke button. He didn't have the choke button. That was that was like a week ago. So, I know we didn't have the choke button, but I didn't even inquire about this because I didn't remember or, like I said, this either just broke or I didn't remember it was broken. The other thing, too, is I did a continuity check on this, and I didn't like the resistance readings I was getting on a couple of these terminals. The, the resistance seemed high, and then I theorized, you know, based on the fact that there's a lot of corrosion on that terminal. You see that bluish-green corrosion all around that terminal? And this has cleaned up some, by the way. I had a hell of a time desoldering this because the solder was so badly oxidized, it didn't want to flow. But anyways, um, I'm thinking, okay, if that looks like that, maybe corrosion has gotten inside. Furthermore, if you look on the body right there, there's a crack. Okay, so there's a crack right there. So, I have no reason to believe that inside here isn't a train wreck. So, oh well. <laughs> Look at the rust on the key ring. <laughs> I think this thing may have seen salt water. I don't know. Which is funny because the motor didn't look like it's ever seen salt water. But the uh, corrosion on this seemed a lot worse. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting to figure out what I'm going to do with that electrical uh, situation, um, I figured I'd work on cleaning up these parts because you see this stuff right here? This, believe it or not, is the remnants of what was once uh, grease that has turned into almost like a waxy gummy residue. It's disgusting. So I want to clean out all of that. And then once I clean that out, um, I'll re-lubricate these parts and I can reassemble a lot of the mechanics. And I can put the new cable in. Um, one of my cables was still good. The other one was trashed. Uh, the two cables, the throttle and the um, shifting cable, are identical. Uh, they're interchangeable on this particular model, in case you were wondering. But there were two versions. Originally, there were three versions. There was like a normal duty, a medium duty, and a, like a heavy duty. Uh, and then they omitted one of those, and they just went with like two options. So you can either get the regular duty or the heavy duty cable. I found the heavy-duty cable online um, from a Canadian seller who had a really good deal on it. He was basically selling the heavy-duty cable, like new one used, 
old stock or something for like about the same money as what I would pay for the regular duty cable anywhere else. Uh, so I ended up getting that. I just got to figure out which one, which two jobs I want, which of the jobs I want the heavier cable on. Do I want the heavier cable on shifting or do I want the heavier cable on throttle? I haven't decided yet. So I'll clean this all up, lubricate what needs to be lubricated, um, take inventory of exactly what parts I still may need, but I think I've got almost everything I need. Like this plastic bushing I didn't order because it's still in good condition. Um, like I said, I do have a detent here that came in. I've got to find the package for that. Well, we're on our way to getting somewhere. Oh, one last word about about this switch so while I was online doing research about this switch uh, I ended up finding out that a lot of people had or at least one person had had success replacing this switch with a Sierra uh, which is an aftermarket parts manufacturer a Sierra switch uh, the part number on that switch is a TM my bad it, the part number on that switch is a Sierra MP41000. And they're calling that an OMC slash Johnson slash Evinrude push to, push to choke button ignition switch Marpac. You get that for 20 bucks shipped off of eBay. Um, so there was somebody online that had the same Merc control that I'm dealing with here who claims, and there it is as a Sierra. Uh, 2498 plus 778 shipping. So this might be like a, oh, that's a Sierra right there too. But anyways, uh, yeah, see this one right here might be a generic. But they're basically making this, and this is the push the key to choke switch version. Okay, push to choke. But the point is that there's somebody online who claims that they were able to successfully install that switch which is half the price of the cheapest price I could find on one of these and about the third of the price of what some dealers want for this switch if they have it and they were able to get that to supposedly fit in here and you basically the button doesn't do anything anymore um, I think on some of those switches it actually comes with a disc or something that goes in here and blocks this hole off so that you don't have a problem with water or whatever getting down in there I could make something easy enough. So that's not a big deal. So I might even... Or I might just put my... The choke switch that I paid for, might as well just stick that... I might just stick that in there just as a placeholder. Not even wire it up and use the push to key. You know, push to choke key thing or whatever. I don't know. But that's another option I wanted to make sure I mentioned in this video. That uh, potential option. Like I said, I'm not saying that switch will fit. I'm saying that on one forum, I found a guy who said that that's what he ended up doing to fix his problem. But I'll tell you, that's not that side there. It's this side here. You've got this right here, okay? This switch sits like this. You see how close that is to there? And the push to choke version of this switch is actually I could tell from the photograph it's physically deeper and I think that when you put that switch in this housing that these terminals get very very close to this metal I might be wrong all right I'll clean this up put it together and at least I can get the cables hooked up